Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hello, uh, welcome to lecture uh, six on uh, week three thermal characterization techniques. Um, thermal electricity from atoms to um, systems. Here we, uh, in this lecture, we want to get an overview of what you learned this week and how various techniques are related. Um, uh, one of the first thing we learned uh, or we started with is really measuring heat flow and uh, temperature at the nanometer scale is a challenge. Why is it? Uh, we learned early on there's a direct analogy between Fourier law and Ohm's law, electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. And even historically, Ohm uh, actually had some intuition and, uh, uh, from the work of Fourier because that was published first. But in practice, if I have a nano object measuring uh, heat flow and measuring current flow are uh, significant differences in the measurement techniques. Why? Is because thermal conductivity of materials that we have at room temperature is only changing by three, four, five orders of magnitude, while electrical conductivity of uh, conductors and insulators are off by 20 or higher orders of magnitude. As a result, we can confine electrical current precisely and we can do precise measurements with good uh, voltage meter and so on. But in temperature measurements, we cannot do that. That's one key difficulty. Uh, be, there's lots of um, cross couplings with the environment. The other difficulty is, a reservoir, by definition, is something big. If we have a nano object near it, the reservoir is not a perfect reservoir. So that affects the measurement and we need to pay attention. Uh, let's start with the simplest way of measuring temperature, which was a micro thermocouple, tiny devices, which was actually based on the Seebeck effect. In two legs with two different metals with different uh, Seebeck coefficient. When this side is hotter, um, hot, it generates a voltage and that's our thermometer. But uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, the other side of it, you need to pay attention uh, that is isothermal and there is no additional contacts, additional temperature differences because that introduces spurious signals. So one way to do it is that you put the thermocouple and a reference one and you do a differential thermocouple measurement and that's what we saw. With that you can measure temperature at scales of a couple of tens of microns. You can do temperature measurement quite precisely with you know 0.1 degree even lower. But the thermal contact between this thermocouple and the object becomes important especially if the object is the same size as the thermocouple. So that's the key thing we need to be careful. So often we have to put a little thermal grease. Early uh, 1990s, there was ideas, we can just m take this idea and miniaturize it for nanoscale. We can fabricate a thermocouple at the junction, at the tip of an atomic force microscope. That's the principle behind scanning thermal microscopy, lots of papers about that. And it works well if you have a smooth object like a carbon nanotube, you can see the temperature profile of an object that is only one nanometer. But in reality, the tip and sample interaction um, uh, is much more complicated. It's not at one point. Often there is a meniscus water. You need to consider a heat, uh, heat conduction in the water. There should be, there could be conduction in the air radiation. Uh, and because of the surface roughness, you have artifacts. So it's hard to do this on realistic devices and samples. But uh, we learned that um, uh, in uh, the same lectures uh, uh, that uh, you can do precise measurement of temperature on the nanoscale if now the contact between a very sharp electrical tip and the sample is used as a thermocouple. So it's, I don't have two contacts here and worries about here. Basically, I have a heated substrate that approaches the a tip that is not heated. When they contact, this region near the tip cools and the temperature difference here generates a voltage. That was uh, some kind of early uh, measurements that showed a near a PN junction within a couple of nanometer you can see the sign of the thermoelectric voltage changing. What you learned um, uh, in uh, Professor Data's lecture early on, one side is negative, one side is positive because one side the carriers are electrons, the other carriers are holes. 
you see that between theory and experiment there is deviation and early on people thought it's just a matter of averaging because you put a heat source here, there is a temperature profile, maybe you get average of these CBEC data. In a later paper in 2005, it was shown that when you do, you have a sample with temp where the CBEC coefficient is non-uniform, and even though you do an open circuit voltage, there could be currents flowing in the device. So what you're measuring is not an average CBEC, but is a weighted average of CBEC by the electrical conductivity. And the simplest way of seeing that, here is the uh, calculated thermal voltage uh, versus position for a PN junction and calculated single grid resistance, basically local conductivity, that changes by order of magnitude. So it's like having batteries that are in parallel with very different internal resistances and that what gives rise to the current flow inside the device. Uh, and one needs to be aware of that to analyze the data. But the similar technique of a heated substrate on a tip, if you are careful and you can position a molecule in it in between, uh, which was done in the work by um, uh, Reddy, uh, Jang, uh, Sigelman, and Majumdar in 2007, can give you a voltage which is proportional to the delta T for an individual uh, molecule. And you can see uh, at each of these uh, delta Ts, there is a distribution, but the peak of this distribution actually give you a CBEC coefficient, in this case 7.2 microvolt per Kelvin. This is the CBEC coefficient of a gold molecule, gold uh, junction as a whole. Uh, um, one of the things we describe is that um, what you are measuring is the property of the compound uh, uh, system. Um, what was quite interesting is that this value of the CBEC actually matched the simple um, experimental data, uh, sorry, the theory that was developed by uh, uh, Professor Data earlier on, just based on molecular orbitals of this and how um, uh, the CBEC coefficient is related to the transmission coefficient uh, of these uh, HUMO and LOMO um, uh, orbitals. Uh, so that we, you see the power of a simple um, uh, calculation based on Landor that can explain complicated experimental setup, uh, but when you have a single molecule. Um, after that, pushing to the limit on the contact techniques, we move to the non-contact techniques to measure temperature. Infrared <coughs> imaging is used often. Uh, it works for microscopic objects, centimeter size for the whole microscope, or even down to tens of micron, but not much below that because that's diffraction limit. A key issue with infrared is you, you need a material with good emissivity, and often metals are shiny, they are not a good emissive, uh, emissive material, and many of the semiconductors we know are transparent at long wavelength IR, so you need to coat it with a black coating and so on, so it's not perfectly non-contact, um, but it still works if you have big objects. How can you go to a non-contact technique of smaller object? The idea is thermoreflectance. And uh, here we showed that uh, the way your eye and a CCD camera see an object, you have contrast region of high reflection coefficient, low reflection coefficient, you know, uh, bright and dark. Reflection coefficient of any object is a function of temperature. If this side is cooler than this, there should be a slight difference in the reflection coefficient. We cannot detect it with a DC camera, but if we have a locking technique, we turn on and off this at a known frequency, then we can detect it and see, for example, this area is cooler. By pushing this limit to the time domain, which was described in the lecture, you can get to the temperature resolution below 0.1 degrees, sub-micron, because you can use wavelength of visible light, and uh, that, with that you can go to two, 300 nanometer spatial resolution. Time resolution can be done by gating the light pulse that is illuminating the surface, and that can go down to even 800 picosecond in a full megapixel camera. And here is an example of such a measurement, high-speed thermal imaging, temperature versus time, and here you see 100 nanosecond, the data points are with um, separation of 800 picosecond, and you can see with a tiny 550 nanometer via how the heat propagating near that uh, copper via at different times. So this is one of the ways to get full field temperature images very quickly.
a um, key question is really we measure temperature by measuring the reflection coefficient how we calibrate it the idea is of course you can put the sample on a known stage if I oscillate the temperature of the stage I measure that temperature with a the thermocouple and I do the same thing locking on a camera I can calibrate it the key issue here is um, the contact between thermocouple and the sample should be good so that the temperature measured here is a temperature of the sample and the thermal masses should be that they follow each other so that puts some limits in terms of the minimum sample size uh, typically you need a couple of millimeter of sample size to be able to do this uh, good measurement if you have a sample where the thermometer is internal to the sample or near where you want to measure already for example with a pn junction nearby then you have the thermometer there you don't have to worry and you can do this faster um, uh, another optical technique that is powerful uh, but is not imaging is single point is raman spectroscopy basically you shine a laser light in a material in the light that is reflected from the material or transmitted in addition to the frequency of the laser, you have slightly up or down converted frequencies and um, the amplitude or the position of these are function of temperature and you can use this as a uh, measure of temperature. Um, one of the advantages of these is that you can actually with this get the temperature profile inside the material if the material is transparent. This is one of the few ways you can get three dimensional temperature profile, but it's point by point and a slow. Uh, special resolution could be on the order of micron, sub-micron. Temperature resolution, because these shifts are not um, uh, appreciable, is typically one degree or higher. Uh, but because you can do gating, uh, you can go down to nanosecond time resolution. Um, after discussing this optical technique, we discuss at the end if I have an object which is uh, like a nanowire or a nanotube, how do I measure thermal conductivity? It's not the issue of just measuring temperature. I need to ensure that there is a temperature gradient and a heat flux. And one way to do that is using suspended microheater membranes, MEMS technology. Uh, basically, this serpentine heater, you send the current, heats up. If this is separated in vacuum from another heater, this one should not heat up. But if I have an object in between, uh, this, uh, there is a uh, temperature rise on the other side from the temperature rise and the amount of heat that I know I can calculate thermal conductance. This works if the thermal interface between this contact and the nanowire can be neglected. And in papers by Li Shi and others was shown that this they need to do some work. It's not automatic. Sometimes you need to do focus ion beam evaporation on something here to act like a good uh, uh, glue uh, to attach it. But the better measurements is when you do four probe electrothermal measurement, which is sophisticated. But if the material it has some thermoelectric property, C by coefficient, actually that can be used as a thermometer and that way you can extract the thermal in, uh, interface resistance between the platform and the object. And that's one way to get the accurate uh, 1D heat flow. Then uh, in uh, lecture uh, four, we moved into in-plane thermal conductivity and cross-plane uh, thermal conductivity measurements. Um, for cross-plane thermal conductivity, a uh, popular technique is called 3 omega. The whole idea is simple. You have a heater line, you send current, it heats up. The amount of temperature rise is related to the thermal resistance of the film and of course the substrate and interfaces. But if you can extract those out or if they are small, by temperature rise, you can measure the film thermal conductivity. But DC temperature rise measurements are not as accurate. And uh, 3 omega technique is basically the ingenious idea of uh, David Cahill. By modulating the current at one frequency omega, you can, and detecting the voltage at frequency 3 omega, you can actually get a better, a higher accurate measurement of temperature rise. And from that, you can get the thin film thermal conductivity. How do you make in-plane Seebeck measurement? The idea seems simple. You put a sample, one side hot, the other side cold, you measure a voltage. What we discussed, the key challenge is to make sure you measure temperature at the same point you measure the voltage. So often you want to use one of the legs as your voltage um, uh, probe. Um, but the other point is that you have to make sure there's a good thermal contact between the two and that uh, requires um, uh, often thermal paste or good pressure and so on. That's something needs to be done carefully. You can also use similar 
uh, hot and cold on a van der Pa or similar technique to measure in-plane electrical conductivity and CVEC simultaneously. Here, uh, again, you have these four probes with this type of patterns. Is one way of measuring thin film electrical conductivity. There are other ways uh, that we describe in that lecture. Uh, doing it simultaneously, the advantage is that um, that way you can avoid sample-to-sample -sample variations and uh, get more accurate data. For cross-plane, Seebeck and electroconductivity, uh, the key challenge is that you need, need to fabricate a device. It's not possible to do with bare wafer. Basically, I have a thin film. I want to measure what is the Seebeck coefficient and conductivity cross of it. So I need to send current across. So I need mesos to confine the current. Often you need things at least tens of micron to be able to handle them and create contacts and wire bounds. To create a temperature gradient across of it, on top of this device, I put an insulator and a microheater. Microheater is a source of heat, but also as a sensor because resistance changes with temperature. When this is turns on, there's a temperature gradient. And from this electrode, we can measure the voltage. So that's a cross-plane Seebeck. Um, but of course, there is a temperature gradient in the substrate. So you need to normalize that. You can put another heater just on the substrate. Uh, Cross-plane Seebeck measurement requires creating a temperature difference that is appreciable across uh, the thin film. Depending on thin film thermal conductivity, you need films that are at least a micron or a couple of microns. For cross-plane electrical measurement, the idea is, well, you can just me put mesos with different sizes and uh, look at how resistance changes with size. One thing you have to be careful is um, that the current needs to be uniform. And uh, because of the aspect ratio, film couple of micron, but film size tens of micron, uh, so you need an appropriate amount of metal. So you need some back of the envelope calculation that is correct. That's the first thing. And the second part of it is the contact resistance is in parallel in series with the film. So you need a low contact resistance. By just changing the size, you cannot extract that. And that means the film thickness typically should be thicker than tens of microns for material with uh, conductivities on the order of 1,000 per ohm centimeter, which is for good thermoelectric materials. That's a limitation for cross-plane electrical conductivity. Then we went to a method to extract simultaneously all relevant thermoelectric property as well as ZT. The whole idea was the same microcoolers that I described before, you send a current and you can uh, create a, temp a current uh, perpendicular to the layer can be used together with thermoreflectance imaging. Now I have a way to measure temperature here and a way to measure voltage here. By Harman technique, I can, uh, from a pulsed current, I can actually get, uh, separate the Joule and Peltier uh, 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 kind of voltages generated across the device. And by changing the polarity, I can um, uh, kind of uh, get the ZT of the material. Um, so that's a way, but it requires uh, measuring tiny voltages with very fast response um, and needs to have a good geometry to, again, to ensure that the temperature is established across this thin film with the area that we are um, using. Uh, one important uh, uh, kind of cross-validation at the end is to use a single-leg Z-meter. What is the idea is if I have a tiny thermoelectric material and I put it between a heat source and a heat sink, if this I have some sort of a measure bar that I can measure heat flux, if I know thermal conductivity of this material, I measure temperature a couple of locations. From a temperature gradient here, I measure the heat flux. If I know the heat flux going through here, and I know temperature differences, from that I can measure thermal conductivity. If these are good electrical conductors, and I connect it to a voltmeter from a temperature difference and a voltage, I can measure Seebeck coefficient. And finally, if there are good electrical conductivity and interface co uh, uh, contact resistances, electrical contact resistances of negligible, I can measure cross-plane um, uh, electrical conductivity. Uh, using these three, uh, but also I can even put a finite load resistance and measure the power coming out. There is a load matching condition that what can get, but that can be calculated. Power out to power in, I can di directly calculate efficiency. So that's a good way to get all properties simultaneously 
in a real power generation without building a device. You need a single leg. Typically, uh, we have done measurements. Uh, this is actually Professor Ram's group that have done measurements uh, with films as thick as 50, as thin as 50 micron, which is quite small, with thermal conductivity 3 to 5 watt per meter Kelvin and with a conductivity, electrical conductivity of a couple of hundred uh, per ohm centimeter. So it's possible to do single leg measurements, and that's kind of the most closest way to do. Uh, uh, ZT extraction uh, uh, before building the model. Uh, and we uh, finish the characterization with a simple laser uh, characterization technique, basically a femtosecond laser coming, heating a transducer and aluminum, and the heat decaying. In this case, aluminum is 15 nanometer, is thin, so that some of the laser at uh, 780 nanometer is penetrating. You see some oscillation in the uh, reflection versus delay, that has to do with acoustic echoes inside, we can neglect it, but the whole uh, curve of how it's decaying has to do with thermal conductivity of the material as well as the interface resistance. And in that lecture we describe you can separate the two um, using time domain thermal reflectance uh, and doing measurements at different frequencies. Uh, there are some complications happen because uh, when you do time domain thermal reflectance, for most semiconductors, you measure a thermal conductivity that doesn't depend on modulation frequency of the laser, but for alloys, you have that dependence, and that has to do with the thermal penetration depth and how that compares with the phonon mean free path, but that's a rich uh, physics of probing phonons that contribute to thermal conductivity. So here is the summary of the whole week three. In the first lecture, we discussed term temperature measurement at the nanoscale and uh, microthermocoupled and scanning thermal microscopy. In lecture two, we went to the scanning CBEC microscopy where the UHV allows us to get a much higher spatial resolution and even uh, cases where similar techniques is used at ambient but with single molecules to get the single molecule CBEC coefficient. Uh, then we went into the optical techniques, infrared and micro Raman. Um, lecture three focus on thermoreflectance, which is one of the powerful techniques to measure temperature very fast and high spatial resolution. We also discuss about suspended heater structures when you have nanowires or other type of uh, characterization to do. In lecture four, uh, we discuss about thin film electrical and thermal characterization both in plane and cross plane and how which type of processing is needed to do that. Uh, transient Harman, Z meter were two important techniques that need uh, that can give us information about material properties simultaneously. Both this one is based on a macro refrigerator, based this one is based on a power generator. Both are an, an actual energy conversion device. So it's a good way uh, to see how thermoelectrics perform. In the last lecture, um, we discuss about uh, time and frequency domain thermoreflectance and how these laser techniques can be used to distinguish between ballistic and diffusive uh, phonons and how they contribute to the thermal conductivity. Now that we have an overview of how temperature is measured at the small scale, how thermoelectric properties are measured, what we will do in week four is we look at uh, some of the applications of thermoelectrics uh, in real systems, for example, for a specific micro refrigerator on a chip, or on a larger scale, uh, where thermoelectric makes sense for power generation as a waste heat recovery or as a topping cycle. And then in week five, we go into some of the physics of how nanostructured materials are used and have been used to engineer the thermoelectric properties. I look forward to see you next lecture.